Okay. So, um, yeah, this paper um, is about uh, a very interesting experiment. Um, and it um, what's interesting about it is that uh, the author leverages the power of sport to um, de-escalate or sort of diffuse a conflict between two extremely um, extremely tense groups, uh, the Christians and Muslims in post-ISIS Iraq. So um, the paper is called Creating Coexistence, Intergroup Contact and Soccer in Post-ISIS Iraq. And uh, the question that the author tried to investigate was, can intergroup contact build uh, social cohesion after war? And how can social cohesion be rebuilt in the wake of violent conflict? Uh, the main hypothesis here is about the intergroup contact theory, which states that um, if two groups who usually been at odds with each other kept be, are in the same environment, um, they tend to probably get along better or be more familiar around each other and perceive each other as less of threats that they would usually. Um, but in this case, the author um, looks at shared interest, contact based on shared interests, whether ethnic identity and politics takes a back seat. So um, what the author did was um, they designed an experiment where there were four soccer leagues um, and each of the two leagues uh, would take place in the cities of Ankava and uh, Karakosh. Uh, the historical context was that um, after an ISIS attack in 2014, a lot of Christians who were the minority were displaced. And ever since the Christians had felt a sense of betrayal and complacency on the part of the Muslims, because they felt like Muslims could have done a lot more to protect their land and their integrity during that ISIS attack. And there was a sense of resentment and not forgiving the out group here who were the Muslims. So what the author tried to do was they, um, they made this experiment with four soccer leagues, because that's a game that usually a lot of people in, in the area did enjoy, but the, the teams are also always segregated by religion. So in this case, um, the research staff, they randomly recruited a total of 51 Christian um, uh, people for these teams uh, out of possible 60 teams across both these sites in Ankawa and Karakosh. And the participants were told that there were two conditions for participating. One would be that each team would have an additional three players who may or may not be Christian, which was randomly decided and um, which would increase their team from nine to 12 members. And second, that all players would have to agree to complete a brief survey uh, about the displacement experience and their views on Iraqi society before and after these games. And this was about an eight to 10 week project. So before they joined the teams in the experiment, uh, the author already did a, did a baseline survey on assessing their beliefs and experiences. And uh, there were some very interesting ways of incentivizing the most, uh, the Christian players to actually um, enter into the game because a lot of them had been very vocal about how they would be uncomfortable playing with Muslim members in their teams. So they had to be promised, for example, that there won't be more than two or three um, Muslim members in their teams. Uh, they had to also be reassured by their local church that this is a positive you know, experience and they should be open to it. So. Uh, the author had to look at some very creative ways of getting the Christian participants to agree to do this. And they were already told in advance that uh, this is for a charity uh, that's being funded by an American university. So they weren't entirely told about the experiment, but they had like a sense of there being some academic and charitable impact. Uh, you can move on to the next page, Noah. Mm -hmm. Uh, what the uh, author finally uh, saw was that, um, oh, I'd actually updated the slide. So what the author saw was that um, the results were definitely positive. Um, there were significant changes in the behavior uh, of the Christians towards Muslim peers, acquaintances, and friends um, upon checking upon their beliefs and their post-contact experience. They realized that Christian um, team members were more likely to sign up for a mixed soccer team in the future, vote for a Muslim player and receive a sportsmanship award or train with Muslims six months after the intervention ended as well. So, um, so the author's hypothesis was very much, um, it was in line with the results and uh, the key takeaways that um, I could sense from here. One of them was that in an organization, in a workplace, there's, people from like different communities, of course, different nationalities and religions, ethnic beliefs, whatever. 
um one thing that can be done here as well is to um initiate meaningful contact that's based on shared interest uh, and managers can start by creating a database of their employees top interests like music sports art and match them into groups where employees with those interests can bond over the same these activities can lead to more ice breaking and you know in large companies where employee interaction between departments is rare or has to be initiated for example there are a lot of big mncs there's like 5000 employees within their like campus office and that's like a lot of people it's like a whole college campus in some places so um so maybe this could be one way to diffuse some of those boundaries and another was which i initially felt like was a little far fetched but a very optimistic um recommendation for uh, organizations within the same industry to get to know each other and have ice breakers among themselves because there's a lot of competition and um there's a sense of like cutthroat aggression in competitive markets um which can sometimes lead to a lot of hostility and rivalry and and that competitiveness can itself make the internal dynamics within a company also very tense and as we can now see with you know facebook getting sued um or like so many large corporations doing some very unethical things just to get their way and make more money which is clearly driven by greed and uh, unethical monopolies coming up ever so often uh, this is some i feel like this is like the future of mature workplaces to have a good relationship and healthy competition with other organizations so maybe there could be inter organizational games and uh, there's already conferences and you know big conglomerates with industries but i feel like those are a little more formal if there were more informal places where people could just get to know each other and um share their vision for like a better industry or or a larger team that they work under that would be interesting so nice one nice nice uh, nice study i i have to say I, first of all great great way of framing this in the organizational context because i think you're you're right on and uh and i love these studies that really really mix applied intervention with scientific research right they're so mm-hmm. cool so you know so they can really be practical and yet also give us some really you know sort of some strong data it's great 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 data that they found from this i think it those to support a lot of other research that meaningful contact yeah. can have on uh mm. this one has also been featured in a lot of uh, development uh, studies journals uh, for example there's an organization called jpal that was incubated at mit the uh, jamil abdul uh, poverty action lab they also won a nobel prize this year in economics wow. um and two of the co-founders are indian as well and they're pretty big in india they they do a lot of development economics research and uh, control groups and experiments so this paper was featured over there as well so a lot of international charities and research organizations have been looking at this kind of research which is really cool right is everybody is everybody familiar with the the sort of seminal work on realistic conflict theory which is sharif's robbers cave experiment do you guys know about that This, so 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 Sharif Sharif was a was a I think he was a psychologist but he so he was interested in what creates conflict and and based on groups uh, based on you know sort of creating groups and he and Robbers Cave experiment is done in the 50s it was a really it's a really famous experiment done at a at a at a boys camp and he put different boys into different groups and they had them get to know each other and bond and do games together and stuff like that and they created names for each other and basically then he took these two groups together and he and and he put them together into different competitions and he saw he saw how quickly they were bonded towards their own group and how quickly they started becoming actually aggressive towards out group members doing things that were you know sort of beyond what they thought and he had to kind of kind of chill out on the experiment for a second because they was getting kind of out of control and then he and then he tried to figure out well, what can we do to get these two groups to to come back out of a, this conflict that they're experiencing with each other and and start bonding again and he he tried to have them do uh he he had to do a couple of things where like that didn't work like one thing was like you know just having like a some sort of social together like having having lunch together and you know that kind of stuff and that like didn't do anything really to to get them to bond and and what what they found was that when they gave them super ordinate tasks they go like they crap they had the truck like stuck in mud and they said you know 
we need to get the, stu- the, the truck out of the mud because the truck is the thing that's carrying all your lunches or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but, but the only way to get the truck out of the mud is for everyone to grab a rope, put it around the truck and get it out. So they, they were, there was this interdependency that, that they created and they were able to get the truck out. And after that, and there were a couple other things they did like that where they, they had to come together and have this sort of meaningful contact where they had a, a group goal. Then he saw a complete shift and they started bonding and they started talking and it was like the, the group boundary sort of sort of dropped. And I, they, this is, I, I think this speaks to something similar as a lot of the intergroup research shows. It's like, it's not just about contact. It's about, it's about having shared goals. You put them on a team together, they get to compete together. They get to have a shared goal together and try, you know, then you start to, you start to really see differences in, in dropping like these group boundaries. I definitely have read some other research that's um, recent that's definitely supported that because that sounds very familiar and maybe it was even mentioned in the one that I'm thinking of. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and I think that's really fascinating that it, it really takes kind of like those shared shared perspectives, shared goals to bring people together and kind of outside of just that, you know, one identity or that one um, in-group focus. I think it's important for the work we do too, like in organizations, like people, people in conflict, Hey, can we give these two people something to get done together where they have to depend on each other to get it done? That can create a bond, you know, that's sort of outside the normal scope of like a traditional mediation or something like that. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, Natalie, you probably did the research recently because this is all reminding me of some of the research that we've been reviewing the last month or so, kind of all aligning together, basic sending this the same the same message that there needs to be kind of structured, organized events to to really bring to build social cohesion. And this study aligns with that. And I just wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge Anupriya's takeaway of building the cohesiveness amongst people in the same industry. I think that that is a, a really valuable takeaway from this and something that's very needed. And it kind of reminds me of our previous conversation regarding media, right? Yeah. Because they're not, they, uh, they're, the, comp- the competition there is so drastic and so real that it's further polarizing and, and yeah. put, you know, adding to the cyclical nature of conflict. So I think that's a really strong take away that we need to all sort of think about and think about how we can do that in our own industries, us as PPS, but every, all of our clients too. Like how can you network and, and, and bond with people in, in your shared industry? Yeah. So I think it takes a lot of intention, right? To even um, like, even with the first point, one would intentionally design their teams or departments in a way that you make sure there's an equal amount or an equal um, sort of proportion of representation from each region or, or religion or what's whatever. Uh, I remember in 2017, I attended a one month long program at Wesley College. It was, the, it was called the Albright Fellowship. Um, and it was mostly students from Wesley College there and two people from my college in India were also selected as part of an exchange. And there was something so different about that environment. Oh, bye, Jeremy. See you later. I'm going to just make Noah co-host real fast so you can continue for just a second. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so uh, what I observed there was that the environment felt so inclusive and warm all of a sudden. It was first an all girls environment. Maybe that was an interesting part, but what was really standing out was actually counted. Everybody there um, in that room, there were there was a cohort of 40 people. And I, I just noticed that, okay, there's like five um, African people from like African American lineage, five white Americans. There's around like five Middle Eastern people around five to eight South Asian or like, and then five to seven East Asian people. And, and I actually did, did the numbers like around the third or fourth week of the fellowship. And I realized these people have intentionally designed it in a way that it is diverse. Like this was strategy. This was, this, this was intent. This was very clear intent. So you can't have inclusion unless somebody intends for an environment to be inclusive, right? So it, it's something 
like design can't just like na- it can't naturally occur to be something that uh, cuts through group boundaries it's really managers and people within an organization who have to want their teams to bond in a certain way and and make sure that the, there's no you know uh, odd tension that's happening along the lines of race or color or whatever yeah I think and i think consciousness builds after a while like it takes a long time for people to realize that there's something we need to do intentionally it's not just going to happen randomly And I think that that's an interesting concept because, um, and, and I know, I, I think I've done some posts on our site before too about, you know, the difference between just diversity and also genuine inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of trainings now, especially workplaces also focus on that concept, but I think of one study in particular, which said, you know, diversity is actually considered only a strength when people embrace the diversity. So in and of itself, it can actually cause more conflict if you don't have people who are willing to engage in that mm-hmm. world. And so I, I think the, the intentionality is a really big focus point, um, which makes me wonder how do we get that as a, you know, a cultural shift, not only in organizations, but also even on a larger scale. Um, you know, I think even, even politically or, um, you know, just within regions, like how do you, get people intentionally engaged with one another um, in a way that is positive and, and trying to bridge, you know, some of the gaps that might exist. I think that's where the, the organization and structure comes into place as, you know, as this research is pointing out and past research, they're not just as, a, you know, it, we're talking about the workplace, right? So we can talk about um, companies and organizations in that capacity, structuring and organizing activities or, or gatherings with intent, right? With the intention to honor the, and, and, and embrace the diversity while also opening up the conversation to make sure that all voices are heard and, and lead to the inclusion, right? I, and then I think, because most of us are spend spend majority of our time with our workplace it kind of starts there and and then i my hopes are the work that we do then trickles down into the family and the personal life and the community life right mm-hmm. yeah I mean, we have a new training that we're offering now that is designed with this intention to bring people together to have these Mm. call them difficult conversations, call them courageous conversations, you know, about what divides us, but also what brings us together, right? And how can we see beyond the the factors of ourselves that divide us and, and instead create that subordinate group identity that Jeremy was speaking of. So that's new for Pollock Peace Building Systems, Anupriya and Natalie, if you didn't know. <laughs> um, it's called Moving from Identity to Humanity. And we, because we're all seeing this, that we're seeing the, you know, as you all pointed out, people are not under, not not looking at diversity and inclusion in, in the right context, right? And like acknowledging the difference of the two and, and the intention that is necessary to lead to inclusion. Yeah. And that's a good point. You know, the, the more you know, you know, if you know better, do better. I, I think that's a good point that even if it starts in your organization, that it's, it, it definitely can, I think, impact you in your personal life and then move on and beyond that. So that's a great point. And no, I did not know about that training, but that's good to know. I mean, that's, that's really exciting. And I, I like that from identity to humanity. I think that's a really, really good concept. And I think uh, when Natalie, like before this, she just spoke about how like it has to be genuine and active inclusion, like the kind of effort that it takes and we need to be at a stage where we actually want that to happen. That happens when norms change, right? Like if the social norm is one of exclusivity, of seeing certain people as superior, etc., then naturally it's like a trickle down. Everybody w- will aspire for that sort of a ideal Um, And what's interesting in workplaces is that once Google or Microsoft and all these super big 
work companies were starting their diversity trainings and looking at you know data about like gender and leadership etc that's when it kind of became cool i think a decade or so ago that more companies started talking about diversity and inclusion and started sharing their data and saying oh we need to try harder and of course there's efforts by civil society as well but it's the bigger companies when they adopt a certain norm and say oh we want this you want to hire people from these these backgrounds and incubate like you know young kids from these diverse ethnic what are minority communities and colleges that's when the other, that's when the norm kind of trickles down and um and holding people accountable is something that you know how suddenly it's so important to be politically correct whether or not the person means it it's like on social media everybody's going to have like a hashtag blm on their twitter or instagram because it's becoming a norm to want or desire inclusion it may be superficial it may the person may not mean it but for a norm to like trickle down everybody wants to see it as the ideal and that's something that i think um also attacks a lot of counter narratives and then the the other side becomes even more aggressive about not wanting too much political correctness all the time etc but i think that there's like a slow transition of culture where even the big people the bigger companies and the and the cooler people whatever when they take charge influencers are going to start going to protest like there's a sense of we do want inclusion and, and this is something we should aspire for at least so very slow change in culture but it's somewhat there along with the um the right wing nationalism that we observe across the world like it's happening simultaneously which is really interesting but um that's another phenomena for discussion for another time yeah agreed on priya that's a really good point um and i think you know bringing it back to our new training that we're offering and i i helped work with sarah a little bit on um getting like materials for it, making a video for it and stuff and i feel like it does a good job and and got to see your kind of presentation of it and i think it does a good job of inspiring and helping helping organizations begin the process of making those structural changes making those changes that and making it more of a process rather than a one time training like you're not you're not going to leave this and be like well that's you know we've done our inclusion we've checked our inclusion box for the year we're going to just move on like we're going to it actually empowers you to go in and like all right let's see how how we can apply this to everyday life and how we can potentially do more conflict transformation how how we can uh impact the structures and the systems that are leading to um inequitable behavior in the organization so excited when that comes out and we get to see you know how it impacts organizations because i think it's a really powerful training and um experience really and um i think maybe sarah you can consider based on the study just adding in a soccer game for everybody to play together or football for um the rest of the world that um, could be part of that could be part of the action steps that the participants create <laughs> it's, it's it's funny though that the cuz i think it was last week or our, our last um weekly research updates maybe it was before the holidays did we not talk about sports and how strong of a sort of incubator that that can be for conflict. Uh I was one of your probably one of either Natalie or Anna Priya one of your studies and just how sports can can be a kind of a third identity that brings people together. Um as kind of a not as cuz I mean I don't know. You you see you see how competitive that um I don't know teams can people can crowd around teams and be a part of teams it becomes their like I don't know become somewhat of an identity. So Um anyways it's it's also one more thing I wanted to say is it's really nice having both uh both of you here Natalie and Priya I know you won't be able to make every single session but it's really nice having the author of of the of the article speak on it because you bring so much more than I could bring reading your reading your studies so it's uh really great having you here Yeah you yeah. actually thought this was like once a month or something um or like all the peace builders i didn't know it was like literally every week yes. and when i saw the youtube playlist i was like oh my god i wrote these wow okay yeah. I, for some reason i think i skipped that period because i also missed a lot of monday meetings cuz it's like 3 am for me um but this time is actually really good this is perfect be good yeah well i hope you have i mean i know you all my number will make every week but um make as many as you can or as many as you want to and we'd love to have you